Hi everybody. Yes, I'm Ant Metzke. I'm lead developer of the pilot system in the Radical Cyber Tools. Um, this talk will actually focus on on the pilot system as an execution layer for um, our, our software stack. I, I give a quick introduction to what we consider to be a pilot system. Very short overview of the architecture and how this whole thing works. Um, but we'll try to focus on the capabilities and performance, but also specifically about the, the various challenges we we face in the context of workloads like presented in in this workshop. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. So the driving workloads are, as you have seen in in today and and yesterday, um, Shantin Jha. Who, who leads our group was giving an example yesterday for deep drive ML, which is very similar to, to many of the use cases shown here, where we are running simulation tasks and concurrently we run um, deep running tasks. Um, on the execution layer, what's interesting about this graph is you, if you look at the different tasks which need to be executed. On the simulation side, you have n numbers of GPU tasks which need to run concurrently or sequentially for that matter but which feed data into larger data collection tasks which need to swap in once the simulations are finished and so on and so forth and on the deep learning side you have potentially longer running tasks any number using very different resources and the the uh, task of the execution layer is really to orchestrate um, the execution of all those elements and to ensure that the resources on the HPC machines are um, used efficiently. Okay. So you probably all started to run tasks on a cluster by writing a small batch script, which essentially just gives some instructions to the batch scooter, how many resources do you need, what's the environment you want to run in, and then you submit your task to the batch system for, for execution. That's very straightforward, but it doesn't get you far if you want to run a workflow, we have task dependencies, if you need to respect the ordering of tasks. So what the next step towards um, running those workloads is you write a very complicated batch script, which does some um, task management. You run the first set of tasks, you collect them, you collect some data, you run the second batch of tasks and so on and so forth. And if that is not sufficient anymore because you need to do some dynamic um, orchestration of your workload, then kind of naturally you end up writing a pilot system. In conceptually, pilot system really is just an heroic batch script. It runs as a job on an HPC system and is landing on the compute node or on the um, batch node, depending on the architecture. And it works then by orchestrating the tasks you intend to run and placing them on the compute nodes in the order required. And obviously the, the um, objective is to run many tasks, run them very performant, um, to uh, utilize the resources you have available very efficiently. Uh, but it also gives you some additional features kind of out of the box. Most pilot systems allow you to submit tasks at runtime. You don't need to specify the complete workload in the beginning. Like if your workflow decides I need more input from this type of simulation, you can dynamically dispatch new tasks to the pilot system which can then be um, executed and placed during one time. Um, another feature you're getting mostly for free is that you get um, runtime reports about the state of your tasks. You get updates about progresses and failures and resource utilization. Uh, and last but not least, um, using a pilot system um, allows you to abstract from the batch system you're using which at least potentially gives you ability to run on different machines, no matter if you're using Slurm or PBS or whatever batch system is available and whatever specific flavor of batch system is installed and, and configured. And having said that, pilot systems obviously also introduce a certain um, overhead in terms of the software stack complexity. Right? What you basically do when using a pilot system, you separate the step of acquiring resources from the step of using the resources for your task execution. Acquiring resources, basically, you describe the pilot job you want, which means you describe the job which is getting submitted to um, a certain cluster, a certain HPC machine, and the total number of cores and GPUs and whatever you want to acquire on that machine. On the other hand, you have a series of task descriptions 
and potentially task dependencies, which describe what are the specific applications you want to place on the acquired resources. And what are their specific requirements? What is the environment you need to run under? What are the modules you need to load in order to have them functional? Right. What our pilot system is doing internally is, an, well, basically exactly as, a, as I described. It's running um, batch script, we call it bootstrapper, on the first compute node. And it's then um, spawning additional components which provide the essential functionality needed in order to run your application task. We have components for data input staging and output staging. We have a component which performs the task scheduling, so which, when receiving tasks, tries to find the available resources within your pilot job in order to run those tasks. And we have a task executor, which is the component responsible for actually starting the processes on the respective compute nodes the scheduler decided to use. And spawning those processes really depends on the system you're using. Um, if you have used different batch systems, you know that you can spawn processes with S run, IB run, AP run, um, MPI exec, MPI run, CCM run, whatever the system mechanism actually is. And, and the pilot system is supposed to abstract those um, functionalities away from you. Okay, so once the pilot system is is um, launched on the different compute nodes, it really creates internally a kind of overlay its own view on what available resources are. And once it's receiving the tasks, it decides to schedule them somewhere and tries to completely fill the available resources for your computation. And for running those tasks, it always depends on the system layer. So we don't really re-implement um, process management on the lowest level. We use the system facilities in order to place the processes. Okay. So some of the performance limitations we are facing are actually mostly dependent on how well the system is able to handle a large number of tasks within a single job. And those limitations vary widely from, from system to system. And this is part of our research to understand what those limitations are and how to handle them um, at scale. Yeah, as I said, another feature of the pilot system is that you can swap tasks in and out during runtime. So once tasks are beginning to finish on your allocation, you can report back to the application um, on your laptop or on the, on the login node, which can then decide to submit new tasks, new simulations to the pilot job, which will um, run them as soon as it can, as soon as it uh, finds free resources. Okay. And once everything is said and done, obviously, the tasks are collected, reported back to the application side, and you complete. Okay, so this is basically how the pilot system works. This is basically what we have implemented, mostly in Python, um, with some interfaces to the different systems available. So the capabilities we offer is, and I mentioned most of those, I guess, um, we can run on many different resource types, in the sense that we support different batch systems, different hardware layouts, and so on and so forth. And we are fairly flexible in how we can execute tasks all types of um, custom and um, generic task execution engines are, are really supported. The distinguishing feature of RP compared to other pilot systems is, I guess, um, how we handle heterogeneity, not only in the type of resources we support, but also in the type of tasks we can run concurrently. We don't think we have any significant limits at the moment on what types of tasks we can run. Any type of um, combination of MPI and OpenMP, or we can run executables and single Python functions, short, long running tasks, and so on and so forth. So this is really fairly, fairly flexible. Okay. In order of scale, we have been making quite significant progress over the last two years. In the past, we have been very limited in, in many dimensions, both in the um, size of the pilots we can support in the task throughput. But over the last two years, um, our system actually managed to begin scaling very well to fairly large machines. At this point, we don't have any hard limitation on the pilot job. Uh, we can run within a single pilot job about 100k tasks, which is both mostly limited um, by the system layer, how many uh, tasks it allows us to spawn within a single allocation. We have been doing a uh, couple of projects where we use 
uh, multiple pilots concurrently, specifically on, on OSG. So we don't have any significant limitation on, on pilot jobs, specifically not on HPC machines, where the limits are mostly um, imposed by the batch system on how many um, jobs you can have in the queue at any point in time. And we don't have any significant limitation anymore on the task size or um, task composition you, you are allowed to run on the pilot. In terms of performance, uh, at the moment you manage if you have very small tasks to run about 100 tasks per second. This is mostly limited by our own scheduler. Uh, we need to decide on what specific core and GPU we need to run a task. Um, so this is about the, the uh, scheduling throughput we obtain at the moment. Uh, we are much more limited on data throughput. Data management is not on our strong side at the moment. So we are able to provide um, input and output staging for tasks very generically, uh, but our approach to data management is at the moment still fairly simplistic. So this is um, work we are going to focus on over the, the next year. We can handle about um, 10 file movement or transfer operations um, at any point in time, and we do have some support for um, biking data staging for, for large collections of data, um, but more work needs to be done on, on that level. What we at the moment support the best is um, linking task dependencies. So if your data are pre-staged on the HPC resource, to ensure that the right set of data is linked into the sandbox of the individual tasks is something we support fairly well. The, the on-demand bulk staging of large data sets to the resource and from the resource, we are not so clever about. Our current runtimes overhead are dominated by startup and teardown. And startup really depends on the size of the pilot. If you're running over a thousand nodes and need to inspect the hardware layout on those nodes and need to create your task execution overlay, it unfortunately takes some time. So we take about two to three minutes um, to spawn a very large pilot. So running a large pilot for a very short of time not lead to high efficiency. Having said that, the usual run times for large pilots are many hours, and then that overhead for um, of about two or three minutes doesn't uh, doesn't matter too much anymore. I, I mentioned the limitations on our scheduler. Um, at the moment, we don't have any use cases which stre stretch the scheduler really to to its limits. But we know there are use cases upcoming which will need um, better schedulers. So we're working on that as well. Um, big work item for us and, and continuous challenge for us is to handle task churn. So if you have a large pilot with many tasks running concurrently, many tasks can obviously also finish concurrently. And being very fast about collecting completed tasks and making the resources used by those completed tasks available again is very challenging. And depends very much on our software stack, but also on the system layer, on the efficiency of the task state reporting and so on and so forth. That's something we have to continue to fight against, um, but only hits actually at short running tasks. For long running tasks, this um, overhead distributes over longer time frames and is, we don't have that much pressure on the system. Yeah. So we do have some capabilities in place to um, easily profile and analyze each and every run, which is very helpful and supports our own research. But usually it's also very interesting to the end user to see what is the actual um, utilization I get out of an allocation. Okay, yes, as I said, I also wanted to focus a bit on the on the challenges we face um, when running at scale and when running very heterogeneous workloads like um, discussed in this workshop. So while our system is fairly flexible and can handle all types of machines and, and tasks, it comes at a price. The configuration of the system towards a specific resource is actually non-trivial. It has been a um, challenge to um, allow users to, to um, configure the, the OCT stack for a specific machine on their own. It's usually our group which has to get access to the machine and configure and tune it to run on a specific cluster efficiently. So it can take up to hours or days or on a difficult system, really also a week or longer, to fine tune the system to run efficiently. We consider this a very significant drawback um, because it really limits this, the number of projects we can currently, can currently support. We do have some requirements on the runtime environment. At the moment, we do require an external MongoDB to be accessible and require connectivity to that MongoDB. 
On systems like LRZ, which has an outgoing firewall, this is um, very difficult for us to handle. Um, that continues to present a challenge in different environments. Beyond the process of um, getting rid of that requirement to replace MongoDB with a um, proper communication channel, which will hopefully alleviate those problems, uh, but that's a bit down the road. Yeah, deployment is a challenge for us. To be frank, we moved to Python specifically to avoid some of the deployment problems we had in the past in, in C++ on a precursor of, of our system. But deployment in Python on HPC resources remains a pain. The, uh, um, the different means to deploy Python modules, yeah, Condor or PIP, and the uh, the differences between the different Python versions and Python deployments are very painful for us to handle. Another problem we constantly fight with is that our code is not very approachable. The system itself is fairly um, compartmentalized. You can swap individual components in and out. You can write individual schedulers for specific use cases. And the reason for that is to a part that we also use our software stack in our own research and our own teaching. So we do have an um, very large, um, well, we do have an academic background. So we do have students which are supposed to do research with our software stack and also supposed to work on specific components in isolation in order to improve them or to do research with them. And it remains for us a challenge to have at the same time a fairly heterogeneous and flexible system which performs very well on high-end clusters and at the same time have code which is approachable and readable and can be changed by students which not too much background in, in coding and HPC systems. Uh, but we are, we are working continuously on trying to improve that, make it um, compartmentalize the, uh, the essential semantic parts of the code to, to make this more approachable. Um, very much challenge for us on executing the types of workloads you're talking about is task isolation. If you look at, look at those deep learning use cases, you have very different, different types of tasks. You have um, GPU tasks using a certain Python stack. Um, you have deep learning tasks might using a um, um, different Python stack. You have um, data collection tasks might be running in C++ and so on and so forth. And while we are conceptually very happy to run those use cases we considered a strength of our system to support heterogeneous tasks and being able to, to isolate them from each other, the systems don't always make this very easy. Um, having contradictory module loads within the same allocation for different task environments on the same compute node and on the forces is challenging. Not all systems support that. And specifically, Python is giving us grief here as well. If one task is using virtual env and another task is using a Conda environment, it can be challenging to have to maintain a, a clear separation between them. And we actually can do that by spawning um, um, isolated processes and different processes groups, but then the isolation becomes fairly expensive and is adding to the runtime overhead. So this is a continuous challenge we are working on, which is also very interesting to see how um, important this is for different use, use cases. Um, yeah, it, it is a challenge. Um, a feature we are missing badly is fail safety. So RP itself hardly recovers from errors, which is a problem, obviously, and also emphasizes the need for fine tuning and stable configuration. That's something we have to handle um, much better in the future. Uh, but also, we don't really handle task failures very well. Um, this can be uh, um, compensated on the application layer to some extent. When we report tasks being failed, the application is obviously free to resubmit or reconfigure the task and resubmit. But the price for that is obviously efficiency and latency. We are working on mechanisms to um, both detect task failures and node failures more reliably on the execution layer, and also to at least provide basic restart mechanisms on the execution layer in the near future. And right. then we have a oh, perfect, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. No, I was just asking if you could uh, uh, wrap up, but your last slide says questions. Yes, that's all I have indeed. Oh, oh that's great. Actually, I had a lot of questions, but your last slide answered them all. <laughs> I was going to ask about task failures. And... 
Um, I, one question, but perhaps more high level, is that uh, some sys admins who run HP systems might view Pilot as a way of bypassing the batch system and the fairness of sharing the system. Um, and I was wondering, what do you have any standard arguments to persuade sys admins that uh, Pilot uh, is, is a is a valid application and and it does need to punch a hole into the wall and to get access to the internet, etc. Yeah, so we have been battling this argument for, for a long time, for, for obvious reasons. Um, the standard argument really is, well, I can give you the use case and you run it via your batch system. Let's see what happens. And usually what happens is you're yeah, either not able to run it or it doesn't perform at all. So the argument really is pilot systems are not supposed to game the batch systems. They are supposed to increase utilization for certain use cases, which otherwise couldn't use your machine. If you want to support this use case, pilot system helps you. And this argument usually flies well if a user group supports it. Okay. Gavin, yeah. it's Peter here. I'm quite keen to ask a question or two. May I do that? No, please do. <laughs> Gavin, okay, can I come? Yes, can you hear me? Please do that. Go ahead, yes. There's a lot of muffled noises here. So, uh, one point about pilot jobs and so on is that they're an absolutely essential way of using supercomputers today. I think we really are well beyond the idea of the good old fashioned monolithic app that just drops onto the entire production partition. In reality, there are barely any applications that get anywhere near running on a tenth of most of the very large machines. Whereas if you have what I would call comp computational patterns of which the sort of things we're talking about in this project are typical, you absolutely have to be able to uh, get onto the machine and run lots of complicated things in a workflow and a pilot job is the only way we're going to ever do that. So I'm fully behind this concept and we can't do much of what we want without it. What I wanted to just come back to with Andre is um, uh, all the things he was discussing in general about deployment and it speaks to usability as well. Um, it's always important in a user-driven project to be clear about these issues. What I was taking away from um, Austin's talk yesterday was, and some you know communications I have because we do work with uh, him and the team in uh, Argonne and Chicago and so on, with uh, you with Radical Pilot is that he sees it as having you know achieved a breakthrough recently in saying to me and everyone that we've got a successful deployment of the radical cyber tools on a bunch of uh, very large DOE machines, as well as Frontera, which is the largest NSF machine available at TAC at the moment. Now, the point is that you also mentioned, Andre, that trying to get uh, radical cyber tools and pilot job deployed, um, let's say on uh, LRZ, has, is not easy. You made that point very clearly earlier on. This is gonna become relevant in what I say in a minute. But the point also is that DOE machines have lots of obstacles in their way related to the particular way they ask people to access them. So there, there, there are stumbling blocks right, left and centre. I wasn't totally clear what has happened of late that suddenly sounds like the, set, the, the, the important breakthrough that's been achieved. I'd like to hear you tell me that, but I also want to add in um, what was discussed yesterday in the wake of Austin's presentation, um, namely the potential for us in Comp Biomed to, to, to extend that capability onto SuperMook NG, we'd need to be deploying the radical cyber tools or some component of it um, on SuperMook NG. You just reminded us that's not easy. Can you address those concerns we have? You, the emphasis being on deployment has never been an easy thing to achieve. Yes, happy to, to answer that, Peter. And, and I know your group has been hurting from the deployment hurdles quite a lot in, in the past. Um, there are two pieces to answer, I think. So to the context of Austin's application on, on Frontera, Summit, um, Tita and, and Stampede and whatever we used um, over the last weeks, to some extent, this has been a somewhat heroic effort because, again, this has been our group deploying on those machines, getting some hacks in place in order to um, circumvent TITAS limitations on AP run on compute nodes and so on and so forth. This was a very specific solution and was made somewhat easier 
by the fact that the workload was a very homogeneous set of, of tasks. Basically, a huge amount of millions of short running single core tasks, which we could, could tune our system to, to execute fairly efficiently. Um, from the fact that we have been running on CETA, I would not derive um, the statements that we support TETA for, for all types of workloads, unfortunately. And having said that, we, we learned a lot over the last two weeks on um, having a couple of sleepless nights and, and are very confident that we are in principle at least able to run on, on all those machines efficiently. Um, what changed lately to make deployment easier? I, I think there are two things. First, our group had been growing, which is fortunate because to some extent also the the effort to deploy RP, the effort to get the deployment stable for certain certain workloads was to some extent limited by the manpower we had. So this has been improving, which which is a big help. Um, but also the system itself became easier and more reliably to conf configure. We are able to tune more settings which are necessary for specific um, runtime environments. And specifically, we have been making progress on the task isolation, which has been a challenge in the past also for your group. Um, to, to run a task which runs in a Conda environment under our pilot system, which, which runs in a virtual environment, has been very challenging, but we made significant progress on, on that end. And we also have been making progress on isolating the uh, the pilot system better from the um, HPC environment and from the connectivity issues we had in the past. And this goes towards um, LRZ. So the last time we have been trying to deploy on SuperMOOC um, has been one generation before, two or three years ago. Um, we haven't been looking at SuperMOOC for quite a while. Having said that, even assuming that the same requirements are still in place, that we need to register a um, static um, outbound port and the static as each tunnel in order to talk to our MongoDB, we probably can deploy on SuperMOOC uh, with some fine tuning. And I'm certain that if we can deploy, we can run efficiently on SuperMOOC, but it will remain a challenging task and will not be done quickly. I assume it takes um, two to three weeks to fine tune and configure. It is a continuous focus for us to improve deployment. <laughs> despite the slow progress. Um, yeah, but what can I say? At the moment, it's what it is. Well, it no, it's, good. it's good that you're saying that. The point that we're coming to is that, you know, as I'm involved in all of this through the user end and the users who work with me tend to try to avoid engagement with this infrastructure for as long as right. they can. It sends a sort of negative vibe that I'm trying to overcome because as I just prefaced everything I said with the a belief that this kind of environment is essential for what we're trying to do at very large scales. It's, it's closing the gap between the aspiration and comments such as you recently made in answering me like we are now in principle able to run on these machines. From the user <laughs> perspective, doing something in principle or applying it to everything in principle, but nothing in practice is a huge difference. So, so really, I need to know about this. For instance, in the discussions that took place yesterday, there's a sense of we could cut through red tape because COVID-19 is such an important target for us to all work on. And you know, the German systems are uh, often wrapped in red tape, but, it, but if we cut through the red tape and only found ourselves tripping over the complexity of deploying, <laughs> Um, yeah. the radical cyber tools, we might not have made the progress we'd like to have. And just to reiterate, we work with you folks and the guys on the DOE machines. And currently, we're sort of not seeing ourselves um, the benefit of this, but I'd like to believe it's there. So it's the usual problem between the user and the middleware provider and resource providers that we're not totally at one yet. Do you follow me? Uh, absolutely, Peter. Do you, do, I, you a, do, you a do you have a deployment, by the way, that works with Slurm as a job scheduler? I can't remember if that's the case. Actually, Slurm is our favorite scheduler, to be honest, um, because it gives us different options to, uh, to for the task execution layer and for the... So it, it's, it's Slurm is fairly stable, so we don't have any issues on the batch system level, really, usually. It's really more on the level of uh, the task execution and, and task isolation. 
So you, you see the problems that I'm getting out of the stability and the persistence and the availability of the whole thing. On the one uh, hand, the, the provider saying something's there and the user's trying to find every reason not to touch it. Yes. So the, the procedure we uh, um, began to adopt to, to address specifically the problem you, you mentioned is we try to obtain a um, representative workload from the end user. Um, then it's our duty to make sure that this representative workload is actually running from end to end and to only send hand over the, uh, the system and deployment to the end user. Because otherwise, to, to try to involve the end user too early in, in testing and iterating the deployment has been too painful. Um, so this is not going to fly, um, at least at the moment, at the current state of affairs. That's a basic, basically yeah. also the thing we have been doing in the COVID effort um, on the DOE and, and ZF machines uh, over the last weeks. Uh, we got the workload from Austin. We deploy and execute, and once it's everything is stable and documented, only then it's handed over back to the to the end user. It's really the only approach at the moment which reliably works and um, gets users to to use the system. And the final point, if I may, is to make again the problem. Uh, make clear the problem that exists on these very large machines with hardwired numbers of tasks that the kind of operating systems in the machines are prepared to support. I think you know what I'm talking about. Numbers Absolutely. of tasks which are still related to the old-fashioned way of running one job on the entire machine, whereas yes. we need to have you know 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 8 processes all flying off at once and their hardware, as it were, is just not fit for purpose. So if I have the time, I'm, I'd be happy to spend a minute on, on this topic because this is one where we made um, significant progress over the, the last year. Gavin, is it okay? I think Gavin's saying it is. Let's just go yeah. through this. Is it <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, process management on HPC system, uh, systems, as, as you say, Peter, is hard. Uh, for example, on Blue Waters, we had an AP run limit of 50 tasks. And we are not able to run a peer run on the compute nodes. So what are you going to do? You, you can run 50 tasks and, and that is. Circumventing that basically means using other process management as, as then provided on, on the system. For Summit, for examples, we had um, great hopes for JS1 SF, which promised to uh, um, support a much more fine-grained um, process management. Um, this didn't really work out. Um, JS1 also supports about 800 concurrent processes. And while it's able to to move some of the process management to compute nodes, unfortunately, it takes the limits with it, so it doesn't really change the, the limits. Having said that, um, there are efforts ongoing on the uh, on the system layer of the HPC machines to improve process process management itself, and specifically the PIMIX effort, the PMI X effort, um, which is the underlying process management for most of the batch systems in existence. Um, targets excess scale and targets large numbers of tasks which are concurrently executed on, on those systems. Uh, we are, to some extent, part of the effort in the sense that we are feeding our requirements into the PIMIX design group and have been running early experiments on Summit in an early implementation of the PIMIX execution layer, and this looks extremely promising. So we are able to run an arbitrary number of tasks on compute nodes. We don't see any specific limits. We see high um, reliability of task execution, very fast turnarounds. The current limitation of using this mechanism on other machines is mostly, again, availability, because it does need support on the underlying batch system, to some extent at least, or it does need support from SRAM, ILSF, or PDS. And if that's not available, it needs um, deployment of a very complex software stack, which we in our group are not able to do. The, the bottom line really is, there is movement on the uh, on the system layer in order to support those use cases much better, which remove complexity from our layer, which we have been fighting with over the last years. Um, this makes us very hopeful that maybe not short term, but in the midterm over the next year or so, when deployment of that lower level of software stack becomes easier, becomes better supported by the different system administrations, we will be able to finally resolve those um, task execution limitations fundamentally. This is not yet there, uh, but we are running um, experiments on, well, I said on Summit very successfully, but also moving to Zeta and Frontera and um, to different batch systems, different deployments. I'm happy to keep you posted on how it goes. 
having said all this, um, this will take time. So there is hope at the horizon, but again, it's nothing which I would promise to any user at this point in time to appear over the next three or six months. It's simply not, not feasible. Very good, Andre. Just last comment there that, you know, one of uh, the guys listening in uh, here, I'm not going to disclose who it is, is, is in the category of, well, currently I can do my good calculations on this enormous machine summit without touching um, the radical cyber tools. Um, we need you guys to get involved to demonstrate to him and everyone else that it really makes a big difference to do that engagement. Right. Yes, I, I hear you. So for, for Summit specifically, so Summit and Frontera at the moment, I think our most support machines because we have been um, doing our own experiments with those machines in the past. I, I think the procedure here is that you would provide us, as I said, an, an exemplary workload. We take care of getting this to work and only then we discussed about um, getting users involved on an existing and tested deployment. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, Peter. Much appreciated. Um, is there any time for one more question? Surely yeah. there must be, Matt. Go ahead. Yeah, loads of time. Uh, hi, Andrew. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so my understanding is that currently you do all the scheduling and maintenance of the software and tasks through the login node, which which poses several issues. So, and, and one of them is, is just it being a bottleneck. So um, the login node is very often a periphery to the entire supercomputer. Um, so, so my question, so I have two questions uh, that are connected to this. So one of them is um, how, how do you deal with this bottleneck in both terms of like um, moving like lots of data uh, once the tasks are finished and 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 and, and uh, maintaining even the small tasks. And the second question is um, whether whether you thought about um, extending or modifying open source software such as Lorem to 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 make it possible to programmatically access supercomputer resources. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um... I read three parts out of it. First, the scheduling and, and load of the login node. Second, the data management. And, and third, um, improving the, the underlying system like, like Slurm in order to make this more feasible and more, more scalable. So on the first part, um, overloading the, compute, uh, the, the login nodes, the actual task scheduling is actually done within the allocation, within the, the pilot agent. The login node um, is still, to some extent, overloaded because our client side is fairly heavy. Um, it, it runs several processes. This is historic, historically motivated because mostly we expected the client side not to run on the login node, but on your own laptop or desktop. The challenge we are facing here is that connectivity between um, laptops and, and HPC machines is nowadays based on two-factor authentication. And automating the uh, access of, of the HPC machines from a remote <coughs> site is not trivial anymore. So we are bound at the moment to usually run on the login nodes, which we don't like. So we are working on lightening the, the load on the client side um, in, in order to, to remove this problem. Um, but also we are working on, a, on improving our connectivity layer to re-enable remote access um, by only authenticating once. But this is work which, which will take quite some time because it's touching the security issues and we are not too eager to <laughs> screw this up, obviously. Um, but again, the, the task scheduling is done on the uh, on the pilot side and um, does not stress the, the login node. Um, the second about task management, we would like to uh, um, better utilize existing uh, existing staging mechanisms like um, Globus Online or um, better use the facilities provided by the different shared file systems. We simply did not have the resources to look um, closer into that unfortunately. So um, I can't give you a good answer on what our plans in data management are because of limited resources. It has not been in our focus for quite a while. And, and while we are aware that this is um, an important part at the moment uh, for, for many use cases, we so far avoiding it by uh, um, pre-staging data onto the clusters. And this gets most of our use cases actually running and, and fairly efficient. 
So we, to some extent, push the problem aside for the time being, unfortunately. Um, finally, your question about working with the underlying system layers. The, the permits effort we talked about, um, I, I mentioned in the past, where we try to collaborate with the, with the underlying process management to improve um, support for the use cases and, and throughput is, is the best answer I have at the moment. This does not include data staging again, um, but does, does target all the machines and all the use cases we need support on different machines. So this is not isolated. This um, actually includes um, integration with different types of schedules and different vendors like IBM and Cray, which are all part of the uh, of the permits effort. So our hopes we like on uh, lie on on getting support from that end. Does it answer your questions? Uh, yes, I believe so. Thank